Oh, there we go. Uh, hi. <clears throat> so uh, I'm Levi Simons, and I'm a high school science teacher with the Wildwood School in West L.A. And I'm also involved with a number of citizen science projects. Um, in addition to that, I'm one of the co-founders of L.A. Makerspace. Um, and I'm also a longtime member of a related makerspace called Crash Space, which is in Culver City. Um, why don't the rest of us uh, introduce ourselves? Um, Alejandro, Alessandro, uh, don't forget to unmute yourself when you want to s speak and then mute yourself uh, when you're finished. Cool. Thanks, Howard. Uh, so my name is Alessandro Voto. Um, I'm a researcher at uh, Institute for the Future in Palo Alto. Um, and I'm primarily concerned with um, you know, economics, but in my free time, um, working with uh, Raspberry Pi and Arduino, just kind of primarily doing art and that sort of stuff. So just uh, interested to see what you guys have to say. Oh, great. Well, as you know, I'm a big fan of IFTF. Of course. <laughs> Stephen, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Um, sorry, I've got my webcam is broken, so it's just audio for me. Um, I'm in uh, New Zealand. Um, I work in e-learning, but I guess I'm interested uh, in Arduino stuff um, just in my personal um, life. I've got kids that I'm trying to get involved in doing citizen science type stuff and in, uh, in electronics, so that's my interest. All right. Well, welcome. Thanks. Paul? Uh, I'm Paul Morgan. I'm a doctoral candidate at UC Irvine uh, in the Department of Sociology, and I'm also a research, or I don't know if I, I always forget if I have a formal title, <laughs> um, with uh, the DML Hub at UC Irvine under Mimi Ito, um, working on research connected into um, the Homago platform itself. So, All right, okay, so um, let's get started. I think, um, you know, I'm interested in, in several of the things you're doing. They're, they're sort of hard to disconnect them. I know that you are getting high school students interested in doing uh, real science, citizen science, and I know that you've been using Arduino and uh, w that you were involved with, with SafeCast. Why don't you just tell us about those things in any order you'd like? Okay. Well, um, SafeCast is the main project I've worked on that involves um, Arduino. Um, a lot of the other stuff involves other types of embedded systems or mobile data logging. Um, but with SafeCast, the idea is that um, in the aftermath of the Fukushima meltdown, there was a need to, well at first we, we wanted to just aggregate what radiation data there was uh, to determine what was safe and what wasn't in Japan and then quickly found out that there was essentially no data being collected and very little of it was actually being made public in any useful way. Um, so within a very brief amount of time, I think it was about six weeks, we had our first device set up where we would take a Geiger counter and then connect it uh, from the audio jack into um, an Arduino board and then log the signal from the Geiger counter and then also take in a signal from a um, GPS receiver and just log that data every five seconds to a flashcard. So that way you can just start building up a, a map using just GPS and just go like, okay, at this time in this place, this is the radiation level. And the role of Arduino in that was just to provide a very um, uniform prototyping platform. So we were able to pretty quickly put together the hardware that would take a Geiger counter and allow us to record data in a way that we could then upload it to a database and start sharing it on the web and showing what was um, what was hot and what wasn't, uh, where the fallout plume had landed. Um, and so over the course of the past um, almost three years now, uh, we've gotten about 12 million data points. Um, and that's primarily in Japan, although we've started scanning other port, uh, points in the world. So Chernobyl, and uh, we've also looked at places like San Onofre, the nuclear power plant near San Diego, um, and other places like that. We've even gotten some into Sudan. Um, there are some local concerns in Khartoum about buried medical waste, that sort of thing. Um, 
And so that's that's what, what, what the role of Arduino is, is it just really lowers the barrier to entry to prototype hardware in much the same way as the open source software movement made it a lot, you know, a lot of the tools behind that made it a lot easier to create uh, publicly available software. Um, Arduino's kind of done that for us for hardware. Um, what, and, what does mm -hmm. it cost to, to connect a, a radiation sensor to an Arduino? Um, the most expensive part is the radiation sensor. Um, the a Geiger tube itself runs close to a hundred dollars. That's just the tube, and then for a decently calibrated um, Geiger counter, you're looking at hundreds of dollars. So like maybe four hundred dollars or more. That's actually the expensive part. The Arduino portion of it is cheap. I mean, you're talking like um, under fifty dollars. So like the Arduino part of it is actually the cheapest part by far. That was the easy part in a sense. Getting a hold of radiation monitoring equipment, especially in the in the aftermath of Fukushima when there was a lot of panic buying of radiation monitoring equipment, was true proved to be very difficult. We were luckily able to pair up with a manufacturing partner called Medcom that had originally done the radiation monitoring for Three Mile Island to start um, mass producing um, radiation monitors using their hardware. Um, but yeah, prior to that, that was kind of a real scramble. But like I said, the easiest part was just getting something prototyped using Arduino that would take data from a radiation sensor and a GPS receiver and just write it to a flash card. That was, in some ways, the easiest thing to do. Okay. So, um, how did um, how did was this organized? People drove around with these things. Yeah, it, it's. Um, I mean, you can walk around, although since it it um, records every couple of seconds, you're not going to see a lot of variation at that speed. So, a lot of our monitoring has been done by taking um, our devices and then. Uh, strapping them to the outside of a car window into just driving around. Uh, we've mapped out a large chunk of Japan doing that. Um, and that's really, and it's all almost been, it's really just been all volunteer. There's such a huge demand for even knowing about this. A lot of people are willing to strap to the outside of a car, just the windows are rolled up and then driving around. We've done a lot of drives in the exclusion zone uh, to get an idea of what's radioactive and what isn't in the exclusion zone. Um, the exclusion zone was drawn up without any sort of um, knowledge of where the fallout really ended up going. Uh, it's just done, they just did concentric circles, you know, 30 and 50 kilometers out from uh, the reactor. But it turns out, um, if you look at the fallout maps, that it, there was a plume, the plume went northwest out of the reactor. So there's actually areas inside the exclusion zone that aren't really that radioactive. Um, that are outside of that where the plume was, and then there are areas well outside the exclusion zone that are significantly irradiated, primarily at this point with an isotope called cesium-137, uh, which has a half-life of about 31 years and has a nasty habit of looking like potassium to your body, so your body absorbs it and gets incorporated in your bones, um, and it's a beta emitter. Um, so it's uh, that's, that's the main issue we have now is mostly cesium-137, and then there's the other, the secondary problem of leak uh, leakage out of the reactor into the coastal zone off of Fukushima. So, what was the relationship between this uh, uh, citizen organized effort and what the Japanese government and the and the power company were doing? Uh, we were mostly an annoyance to uh, TEPCO and the Japanese national government. Um, the attitude was, "Don't ask questions. We know what we're doing." Um, there, no, there was no effort to really actively try and stop us, but there was no real effort to also support us either. So we did what we did independently uh, with no real uh, official help or hindrance. That started to change this year with local governments in the area of uh, around Tohoku that was affected by the earthquake and the meltdown. Uh, so there are city governments that have been working with us um, and we also have Japanese postal workers who want to strap up monitors to their cars on their routes because they do these regular routes, and so you get like a, um, a reliable data set doing that. Um, but that's another level of bureaucracy. You know, even though there are postal workers that would want to do it, it's dealing with the national post office in Japan, which is uh, 
kind of a, it's an elite, it's sort of a different than anything else in the U.S. Um, because it turns out the post office in Japan is not only the post office, it also is the largest bank in the world by capitalization and also runs the pension system for Japan. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's kind of a strange beast uh, and it, it's very Byzantine uh, to say the least. So no one's really, um, it's been local governments who have started partnering with us now to get, to get monitors out there, but the national government really doesn't have any interest in working with us. So there, the, there's the radiation detecting sensors, and then there's yeah. this Arduino uh, with GPS data mm -hmm. logger to a, a um, SD card. I'm assuming that you can take the radiation monitor and substitute other kinds of sensors to do environmental monitoring. Yeah, and that's actually where we're going to now. So that we're working on the next phase of SafeCast, which is uh, air quality monitoring. Um, so radiation, it was, it came, the reason why we did radiation is like, well, there was just a very, that was the immediate need. Um, but one of the issues we had is we never were monitoring radiation before the meltdown. So it's like, we'll never quite know what, what, what the change was. So the conversation came up um, within the first year is like, well, what can we monitor that's sort of like the next emergency um, where we know that where we have a good idea is probably going to be another emergency. And that's where the idea of air quality came in, especially because we're all aware of the uh, air quality in places like eastern China. Um, so in that case, we're looking at, okay, instead of radiation sensor, let's take data then from various air quality sensors like particulate matter sensors or ozone sensors and so on. And that's what we start working on. That progress has been slower, and the reason being is that air, there's a lot more things you have to take care of than with radiation. In a sense, radiation is one of the easiest things you can measure. You're measuring one thing. It's relatively straightforward to calibrate it, um, and that's it. Um, with air, you're dealing with um, things like cross-contamination, so like having sensors that will measure ozone, but you can also get, you know, how much of a false signal do you get when you're measuring like that and like some ammonia comes by or something like, you know. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of work now with calibration and prototyping. We've gone through a couple different sensor technology types actually to try to get reliable readings um, and trying to do it for a reasonable cost so we can mass produce them. Um, the, the EPA, for example, has these very high-end monitors, but they're, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. So our big mission now over the past year or so has been, you know, doing this um, for under $1,000 a unit, having multiple sensors on a board that will relay the data to an Arduino board, which we can then, like, relay that information uh, online, uh, hopefully in, in near real time. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's just slower going. I mean... So when, you say, when you say we, are you talking about safecast.org? Yeah, th this is still safecast. So the air quality stuff is still safecast. It's, a, it's the second phase of what we're doing. Can anybody join in on this? How's, how is this working uh, yes. institutionally? Safecast is almost entirely volunteer. Um, we have a few people who um, are paid from, you know, so from research grants to help administer it, but it's almost entirely volunteer. Um, if you want to get involved with um, taking data, um, you can either, you know, borrow one of our monitors as one, as we've had people do that. Um, you can also buy the monitors uh, permanently. Um, and now Medcom, the manufacturer, sells them now based on our design. Um, and then the data is all there publicly, so if you want to actually use the data um, for your own research, it's all there. So we have all the data is under a Creative Commons zero license. So it's free to use, um, and it's out there uh, for public consumption. Um, there. So should we take a uh, just take a, a minute here for anybody who has questions up to yeah. this point? Yes. Alessandro, did you have a question? Uh, yeah. Had you guys experimented with? Um, like networking as opposed to just local storage on the SD card. So I know that the the Arduino UNE is coming out, so you guys would have Wi-Fi. Um, I think the uh, the Texas Instruments version that's coming out has like um, was like an XB on it. 
And I was just wondering if you guys had experimented with um, like Ethernet or any other kind of way of of getting that more in in um, in real time as opposed to draw um, kind of um, bringing it back to the computer and logging it. Yeah, actually, um, we uh, some of the original batch of radiation monitors were used a, a fixed line connection uh, Ethernet, although the vast majority were mobile. With air quality, we are for the most part looking at fixed sensors. Um, the reason being is that most air sensors are, you're, you fix them in a location, you let the air go over it, uh, and we're going to be co-locating with the EPA's monitors in Southern California's calibration. Uh, so that's, our plan is for the air monitors to just be uh, Ethernet only, uh, and we may start switching to Wi-Fi, but I mean, if I don't know, in a sense, if, we're, if we need battery, if we need like uh, fixed line power to keep them running for a long time, might as well stick with Ethernet, so... Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, St Stephen, you had a, a question for Levi? Yeah, I was just wondering um, how what he was proposing compared to to the AirPi air quality monitoring system. It's, it sounds like it's a lot fancier um, than that, that. You know, these are just a couple of uh, UK schoolboys who have connected a whole lot of sensors to a Raspberry Pi. I don't know if you're aware of it or not. Um, well, actually, I'm looking at the site here. What's their, uh, what's the, what, I mean, so the, the Raspberry Pi map part makes sense, and I see the target gases they're looking at, um, but what are, it looks like they're using these, oh, okay, just looking from the diagrams here, it looks like they're using what are called S, um, it looks like they're using these, um, it's SGX. No, wait a minute. I'm trying to. T I'm, I'm trying to t tell what the hardware is here. Build your own. Okay. Um, just looking at the hardware. Because it doesn't. It, these don't look like the same air sensors uh, we were using. Um. Yeah, my impression was it's pretty cheap and. By comparison, like the five ten dollar sensors, I think. Yeah. Do they say it? Ah. Okay. Here we go. I got the sensors. Yeah. Okay. So they're using. Oh. Yeah. These are the standard ones. So there's. They're using what are uh, these are uh, the MI the MICS series. So these are. Gas sensors that are manufactured by a company called E2V, which was formerly SGX. And those sensors are reliable. The issue, though, with them, and we, we've, we actually did work with them, um, is that they don't provide readings really below a certain threshold level, so they don't... They'll measure stuff in the parts per million resolution, but at lower levels they don't give anything, so they... Um, anything useful, so um, the range on them is kind of limited for what we're trying to do, which is measure both in environments um, in the U.S. and in places like China, which are orders of magnitude more polluted, and still use the same hardware. Um, but yeah, these the, the, the issue we had with these, though, is that they, their resolution is in the parts per million, and we, we actually, in order to be useful for the scientific community, we really want to be at parts per billion. Um, and for that, we're, we've gone over to a, a company called AlphaSense, um, and I'll just type that in the text here. <laughs> All right. So these sensors, and I'm pasting them in. Um, it, so the the AlphaSense ones, and we're looking at AlphaSense actually to be our manufacturing partner, kind of like Medcom. So the resolution of this is parts per billion, and it provides us with the ability to measure levels of pollution from all, effectively zero. Um, all the way up to levels that we would expect to see in heavily polluted areas, such as in eastern China. Um, the other stuff that's been done, like with E2V, um, is okay to give you an idea, but it's not going to be research-grade data, um, and that's kind of the issue. Uh, however, they do; those sensors do get around the issue of some other sensors where... Um, they're used for alarm systems, so a lot, the, a lot of the earliest attempts at air quality sensing with citizen science ran into 
the problem of the cheaper sensors where um, you could produce, you could use a lot of them, but then the issue was that they would give you good differential measurements in gas concentration, but very poor readings of absolute gas concentration. And the reason being is that most air sensors on the market are meant for alarm systems, not for actual monitoring. Um, and so that's why we've gone over to AlphaSense for hardware. So where, where do the high school students come in? You, you've mentioned research yeah. quality data mm -hmm. um, and citizen science. Yes. How, how, do, how do you get high school students to do real science that, that scientists can, can use the data for their research? Um, well, it really just depends on like whether um, I have I've had the liberty of running a student research program and going as far as the students want to go with it. Um, so I have some students that have a great deal of skill already in engineering um, and have helped in troubleshooting. So for example, with SafeCast the radiation stuff, getting involved in troubleshooting the existing radiation hardware we had, um, collecting data. So collecting data is actually something that almost that any student can do Like once they have the hardware. So I've had a number of students who borrowed our monitors and then drove around and uploaded the data and, and looked at it. Um, I've had students who have troubleshot hardware, uh, and one of them who um, is now a sophomore in college but still working with us found out that there was an issue where there, a poor soldering job on some of the boards was acting as an antenna, and the antenna was picking up, um, it was picking up the high voltage line signals. Uh, in LA, and so it would give you false positives. So it would look like areas underneath high voltage power lines were really radioactive. Um, and he was able to work backwards and figure out what was going on. We were able to fix the issue, which was actually was really important. Um, and he's all we've had students get involved with uh, prototyping the air quality stuff. So in the first couple of iterations of the air quality sensing, we've had students who've worked with Arduino uh, as a hobby, who have like helped with the uh, development of that and testing out hardware. Um, and I've had uh, some students who have gone with me to Tokyo for that. I've had some students who have gone with me to Tokyo to actually field test some of the first air quality monitors that we had developed. Um, so like going out into the busy, we went out actually, the beginning of this year we went out to the intersection called Shibuya Crossing in Tokyo, which is the busiest intersection in the world. And we brought our monitors out and to record levels of um, carbon monoxide and volatile organic compounds um, just to see what we would see. And we got this very predictable sawtooth pattern because every minute you'd have all cars and then every minute you'd have all people. And we just stood, it was freezing. It was about, it was cold as ever gets in Tokyo. And we just stood out there for like 40 minutes and just kept like logging this data, logging this data. Uh, and I actually, I think I can get, um, yes. Go. I think I can get the blog post for that. Here we go. Yep. So I'm going to post that right here. Uh, and that's this post is um, from the beginning of this year. So I went with a student of mine who's a senior now uh, who has an interest in air quality and cardiovascular data. So she's going to be, she wants to go into public health. So she's been working with me now. This is her third year working with me, um, which is, again, like a number of students I've had, like have worked with me now for like three years at this point. So they've really like taken this on and gone much further than you would have ever normally gone in a high school curriculum. Um, this is just for SafeCast, and there's a bunch of other projects that are, are kind of like that as well. So what kind of uh, what kind of projects do you use uh, to introduce? It sounds like you're talking about uh, students who already know a fair amount. Um, do you introduce students to Arduino and sensors? Yeah. Um, so with that, it's they start off with enough. I mean, I don't know how much skill it is, or just like a lack of fear of just dealing with it in the first place. Um, but I've, yeah, a lot of times, you know, for students who haven't really ever played around with Arduino, like, I've, I've introduced them, I showed them, like, okay, this is, here are the basics with it, like, here's, like, how do you make it blink, and that's, like, always the first one. Um, and then going into taking input, because then after that, then we start getting into, like, okay, well, what's the input mean, you know, 
And it turns out all it is is a voltage. So you just need a device that will provide you a voltage. And that's where we start getting into a lot of things like learning how to calibrate. So I've done a number of different projects with students involving the idea of measurement and how do you know what you're measuring is really you're measuring something. So I've done that just as proof of concept with like I worked with a student to make a, a range finder and he just used, we just used an infrared sensor and just kept making measurements with uh, a ruler and a bunch of other stuff like that and making a calibration curve. And it was just like an introductory exercise, like this is what calibration means, this is what like when you get a, a laser, you know, one of those like laser range finders and you point it at something, like it has, it knows that, oh, that's two meters. You know, so, um, and he wanted to do that because he wanted to make a, a robot that was motion controlled, um, for example. And so that's, we did that over a couple of months. And this was starting from never working with Arduino before to making a robot that responded to motion input so he could just gesture around the robot and it would, you know, it would start doing stuff. So. Anybody have questions at this point? Well, tell us about what you're doing with uh, uh, Makerspace and, and, and Crashspace. So these are, are not officially affiliated with, with the school. They are places where people come to hang out. Yeah, those are totally independent. Um, so Crashspace is older. That started in 2009. Um, and so our founder is uh, Sean Bonner. Um, and he had seen hacker spaces in other parts of the world and came back to LA and was like, we need one. And so he put a call out and pretty much immediately on that first day he put the call out, there was a big you know, group of people that met up with him saying like, yeah, we need to make this happen. Um, and that was one of those other things where there was just such a demand for it. Um, in the space of a couple months, we got a space in Culver City um, to start running as a community tool shop and lab space and just just a general space where people could like work on coding and electronics and we have all sorts of stuff now. So we have like a wood shop, Tesla coils, a uh, bunch of 3D printers, laser cutter, um, tons of computers. Um, and I came into Crashspace in 2010 uh, initially looking help, uh, for help with this uh, Android development project and very quickly got involved with Crashspace. Um, I started working with them on like becoming a nonprofit and a bunch of other stuff like that. Um, and in my in working with Crashbytes, I also um, was interested in getting high school students involved with stuff like this. So I started bringing some over and getting a few students involved as interns. Um, and that was kind of iffy because like there's essentially zero safety in a place like Crashbase. Like a lot of hacker spaces are like this where to be a member you pretty much sign a piece of paper saying like you're we're not liable like if you rip your arm off kind of thing. So there that was part of the community that was saying like well hacker space is really awesome and it's got to be a way to get high school students and younger involved in this sort of stuff. So there was in in early, it was like in the spring of 2012, uh, I and Tara Brown and uh, a couple other people, some who were already involved with Crashbase as well, met to start putting together the idea of making a hackerspace that was accessible to people of all ages. And that's what LA Makerspace grew out of. And so we, we ran, we've been running it. We ran it out of a space downtown for a year. Now we're starting to partner with the LA Public Library to start running events and uh, workshops and things like that out of the uh, LA library space. Um, in particular, the one in Koreatown in Los Angeles. Um, and so with Crashspace, I've just, that's how I got connected with Safecast because Sean Bonner is one of the founders of Safecast. And then with LA Makerspace, that's where I've um, been building out a citizen science program even further beyond like my school to connecting with students from other schools. Um, so I'm getting students from a number of high schools to work, you know, either on site at a lab that I, um, with people I'm partnered with, or to work out of a, a community lab space um, and actually just cross pollinate. So this summer I ran a program where we had students working on completely different projects, but working in the same place downtown and like and working on this every day. So. So what? 
it sounds to me like you ought to write a little guide to using environmental sensors with Arduino. Mm -hmm. Or is there such a thing? Uh, I of, feel like I've seen one of those. Um, that sounds about right. I remember talking with Mark Fraunfelder of Boing Boing about this like a couple of years ago. Uh, if I remember, it's like one of those O'Reilly books with the animals on it. I'm pretty sure I've seen, hold on, let me see. I know that I've seen this before. Uh, well, you know, I just Googled environmental sensors Arduino and a place called Tross and Robotics comes up uh -huh. towards the top of the search. Ah, uh, here we go. Here it is. It's it is O'Reilly. Uh, the title is Environmental Monitoring with Arduino, and I am going to share this link with everybody. Oh, yeah. Oh, and there's so, a review of it available yep. as well. So it's Arduino is really useful because it just, in terms of getting from not knowing much about hardware to making something that's actually a decent monitor, it really lowers the barrier. Um, so, I mean, I have I have a background in detectors, but, I, you know, it makes it accessible enough so that somebody who's in high school, I mean, albeit maybe really motivated, can actually make us, you know, significant contributions to making something that, you know, a research scientist can actually access the data. Um, so it bridges that gap. Uh, it, it, it sounds like this is uh, could be the start of something really Im important on the education side because, after all, every science class is really just kind of a toy class. You're not really doing science. It's you're not contributing to public knowledge. You're just kind of repeating what people have done. I think what you're saying here is that you are at the beginnings of high school students actually producing data that scientists can use for real peer-reviewed research. Well, I mean, that's actually very explicitly my goal. Um, so I'm a big believer in the apprenticeship model of education. Um, I was lucky enough, so growing up in high school, that my high school physics teacher was doing work with Fermilab, and through him I got involved with doing research my senior year of high school. Um, and that was a really important experience for me, like least of which because it got me into college, essentially. Um, but it was, I think that for most of human history, the way you learn something is you hung around with other people who were doing what you wanted to do. Um, and I think that we really can get back to that. In a lot of ways, it makes it far more meaningful. Um, so I've had the luxury, again, of running these programs where I can get high school students involved with this, you know, doing actual science um, as opposed to, you know, what a, a class is. And even like, you know, even like what I do in physics, like I do everything based around labs. I mean, even that's really hands-on. It's still like, there's nothing new about it. We're still doing like, this is thermodynamics, these are gas laws, you know, stuff like that. There's nothing inherently new about it. Whereas with the student research work, like they're actually they're working with actual labs, they're contributing to it, and there's no real set curriculum. You learn stuff because you're interested in it or you need to figure it out. Like I had this whole um, project I was working on with a number of ninth grade students. Um, we were doing material science work with Caltech and we got to the point where I was just like, okay, like I'm gonna need to teach you linear algebra, which like normally never comes up in high school at all. Um, and it was one of those things where we got to the point where we did linear algebra, and then we got to this point where we're like, okay, this is way too hard to do by hand, so now I'm going to have to teach you Python in order to, you know, make use of, like, all these, like, horrible matrices that you've just made. And so you kind of go at that point where, like, and a lot of times I end up learning at the same time they're learning. So, I mean, I don't get bored with it. And that's true, of, like, really of any of the biodiversity and biology research projects I've been working on with students. Like I, the last bio class I took was in 1997 or something like that. I mean, so uh, and then like now I've been working, you know, on things like um, mapping up biodiversity in insects over a large period of time in the LA Basin. I have, my background's particle physics, but bugs are interesting. 
So I've gotten involved with students on studying bugs now. Um, and I think that's, for me, like, I've gotten to the point now with teaching physics where, like, you could probably wake me up at 2 in the morning and I could do a decent job of teaching what I teach, but I don't want to live my life being able to get away with it that easy, so. Where do you think uh, Arduino is going with uh, the kind of stuff you're doing? Um, I think that they'll probably, there's going to be some work towards, like, maybe making it a little easier or a little more accessible to use, but I think that the next step is really um, adding on more inputs. The basic idea of Arduino is nothing in of itself terribly spectacular, it's just that it's done in such a way that there's a very low barrier to entry. In, in essence, if you strip it down, it's there's a processor and it's got inputs and outputs. That's it. Um, you know, but what makes, what's sort of revolutionary about it is that it's very standardized, it's like, you know, the Model T Ford, like, it's not necessarily great, but wow, is it really standardized. And, like, it's really easy to mass produce these things. Uh, what I think it allows for people to do is, okay, we're going to test out a prototype, and it's going to be really easy to set it up. And then, given that, we can then send off the instructions to another company, like in our case, we did it with Medcom, and mass produce them. Um, but it allows for people to do, individuals and small groups to do R&D. I think that's what Arduino really allows for, is for you to do the R&D, and then a manufacturer can just go like, oh, that's how you did it, okay, and they'll use the Arduino platform anyway, because why might as well, and just like crank them out at a large scale. Um, but it, it really levels the playing field. You're using the same tools that a bigger company is using, just like, um, you know, just like, you know, how now with computers, like, you have a computer, and the Fortune 500 companies have a computer. Great. You know, but you, you're both using the same kind of devices at this point. Um, Alessandro, I know that, uh, that Marina uh, wrote in her book about uh, citizen science. Is Institute for the Future doing anything with things like uh, Arduino and, and sensors in citizen science, or looking at that? Uh, yeah, well, we're looking at um, maker cities, so um, this idea of, of empowering people to be able to make things in, on the city scale. Um, we've taken on Ari Gentry, um, who was um, co-founder of BioCurious, so um, she has that background and brings that to a couple of our teams. But um, I've been trying to lead a couple of um, small Arduino classes to get people kind of um, in on that, any of the staff, and hopefully um, we, we do these co-working events once in a while, and I really hope to kind of get the community engaged in doing some fun Arduino-type things. and. Um, Maybe even imagine kind of like a, a future fortune telling kind of thing uh, with thermal printer, but that's I, I hope to do that at some point. But um, you know, you can set up a geek out of your own. Um, you don't need me to to set it up, so you could always use that to uh, to get people together. That would be awesome. So, um, Levi, what directions? What's where are you going next with uh, with your students? Um, the next big stuff actually is, so there's the air, the air sensing stuff that continues on, um, and that's, 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 again, it's, there's just a lot more things that can go wrong with air, so that's been much slower going. Um, and then a lot of stuff in terms of biodiversity research. Um, so we're working with a number of teams at USC and the Natural History Museum, um, and we have this project that we've been, um, starting recently called Bioscan, and I'm going to um, bring that up here. And what we're doing is um, have, we have 30 weather stations, and um, we're taking, um, the weather stations have insect traps, and so every 10 minutes we ping back uh, what the local microclimate data is, like soil mo moisture and then sunlight intensity and so on. And then every week, we collect all the insects that get captured in these jars at the stations, uh, and they get sorted. And so the citizen science part has come in through things like the actual sorting of insects, and now we're getting to the point where we're starting to look at genetic sequencing of the insects um, to look for things like um, adaptions to microclimates, when do species actually split off from each other um, on this scale, and even things like seasonal variations and the impact of, um, uh, on their genes. Um, so there's some evidence that because the insect life cycle is so short, 
that over the course of a year or the three years that we're going to be running this project so far, you'll actually see the ex gene expressions change based on the climate and that you also see natural selection pressures over the, you know, the cyclical period of the climate affect which populations exist where, which populations are migrating where, and so on. Um, there's a, there is some stuff that we're starting to do with the, looking at the idea of biodiversity in urban environments. Um, cities don't wipe out species, but they change the environment in such a way that every, the niches totally change. Um, so human beings alter biodiversity so that completely new things are going to adapt here. I mean, it's very, one of the things we point out even before we're collecting that much data, because this is a relatively new project, is that LA is far wetter and brighter than it would be normally. The fact that we have electric lights, the fact that we've diverted rivers to go here, completely changes the microclimates in this area. Um, and the same can be said with urban environments all over the world. I mean, the example I give is that a cockroach is a subtropical species, so what is it doing living in Oslo, Norway? And the reason is that human beings have altered the local environments to the point where they can do that. Um, and so we're studying that. We want to see things like evolution in, in real time, and we want to see the impact of microclimates and, and urban environments on evolution, because we don't really know. We're going to be studying um, insect biodiversity at you know, a resolution far beyond anything that anyone's done in even places like the Costa Rican rainforest. Um, so we're not even quite sure what we're going to find. Um, we'll probably find some more new species, just because nobody's really bothered looking at that detail you know, in a place like L.A., um, so that's that's a lot of where some of this new stuff's going. So it, it doesn't sound to me like Arduino plays a big role in that. I mean, uh, with, with that one, no, not with that one. Um, that's much more of the the squishy science stuff. Um, with Arduino, like uh, in terms of other stuff with detectors, um, one of the things, uh, so another project working on is called the Global Sensor Web, which is initially developed for Android devices, but it allows you to relay sensor data from phones. Uh, so things like the magnetic field sensors and so on, and, and ping it back to a central database so you get geotag data on a large scale. So you can look at magnetic fields across the entire continental US. So you can look at cosmic rays from the detected by the camera's phone. And one of the ideas we had is like developing hardware that would also ping back to the same API. And the easiest prototyping platform for that is Arduino. So you could imagine another fixed line device that's pinging back to the same API and it just says, like, look, I have this GPS location. This is what I'm reporting. So um, this is a, like a sensor that you plug into your phone? No, it, we, we, use, we use the phones themselves. You use the phones themselves as sensors? Yes. So the, in terms of having sensors that we could plug into the phone, that's later on. Uh, we're focusing much more on the software right now, but down the line we have talked about hardware, so like adding on sensors that aren't normally in phones. Um, but for time being, like we're looking at the sensor data that comes off of phones. So the common ones that are, um, so the common ones that we're, we're uh, pinging back from a phone are magnetic field data, which your phone has because of compasses. Um, the accelerometer, which just basically tells the phone to go from landscape to portrait mode and so on. Um, and then you start looking at other things like the camera acts as a detector. So that's one of the things we've been using at detecting cosmic rays. Um, so the idea is that we can actually look at the energy deposited by high-energy particles coming in from space and using the camera as a particle detector. Um, and then, depending on which model of phone you're talking, the newer ones have built-in air pressure sensors because it tells you which floor you're on in a building. And some people started looking at the idea of using that data for things like distributed uh, weather monitoring and so on. So your phone has a lot of built-in sensors now, um, and there's a lot of things you can start doing with it. So um, I know uh, Pam had a question about the yeah. insect data. Pam? Hi, sorry. Did you see that in the chat? I was yeah. The so the insect data we're posting, we're going to be posting online, um, and that's going to be through the Natural History Museum. So we're actually in the process of building the database. Right. We're just starting to sort through the insects, which is turns out to be a pretty monumental task in terms of just sorting and big data. Um, we have 
with very little training, people can sort them down to families. Um, and then as we go further and further down towards the species level, we need to start bringing like more and more specialists. Uh, so we've been sending up a lot of samples to different labs around the world. Um, so the data is going to be posted online. Um, we've talked about using uh, Plus One is the ultimate source for paper publication, but for the data, we're going to have a public database. We haven't figured out what the, the address is going to be, the structure of that. We're just in the process of just physically sorting millions of insects right now. That's so. what I wondered, whether you were going to try and make that something that citizen scientists could participate in. Yeah, so we actually have had a lot of work done with, with people sorting it. Uh, so some of my students have been involved in that sorting process. But as you go further down towards the species level, you need more and more training. Um, and so just some, like in terms of the citizen level, you're going to get about halfway there. That still takes care of a huge amount of work um, in terms of getting past that bottleneck. So that's where we're at. And the data we're, will be posted online. It's, that's going to be a, a long-term process because we're collecting data for at least years. So it'll be mid-2016 is probably the, our last insect we're going to be capturing this project. Um, but it is going to be, it will be completely open. Well, you've been talking for uh, most of an hour. Um, anybody have questions uh, for Levi uh, about any part of this? Well, if not, Levi, anything you want to add before we adjourn? Um. Let's see. Um, what do we have? I mean, I guess a lot of we're this is grow, uh, growth out of LA makerspace is that we're working towards a dedicated community lab space for citizen science for high school students. So we we ran that this summer out of LA makerspace downtown, and we're we're looking at doing something like that on a more permanent basis out of the LA Public Library in Koreatown or. It looks likely that we'll get some site at the Natural History Museum and or USC. So that's where to look for in the near future. So uh, Homago really grows out of uh, connected learning and the connected learning is all about moving learning out of just schools but connecting after school spaces, libraries and, and museums. It sounds like the kind of project you're doing would be ideal for getting museums and libraries involved. Yeah, so the Natural History Museum has already been a partner with us and now we have the LA Public Library. So, Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, really interesting. I, we, this may be a historical document. We may look back on this in a few years to see the origins of something really big in terms of lots and lots of students doing real science. That's well, what I, most science actually started off with what we would call today amateurs. Yeah. Professional science is the new thing. Yeah, great, good. All right, if there are no more questions, I think we'll adjourn. Um, thanks so much, Levi. This has been fantastic and it makes for, um, I think, a good document for, for others who want to get started in this. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Levi.